Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we come together to worship the Lord our God on this blessed Sabbath day. And as we begin today, just a few announcements. First of all, uh, thank you again uh, for all your prayers and your support for uh, the Smith family. Uh, Pastor Miss Geneva, again, we give thanks again uh, for her testimony and for the example uh, that she has set for each and every one of us of what it means to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask you to continue to be in prayer uh, for the Smith family and for all of us uh, who will miss uh, dearly Miss Geneva. Again, thank you again uh, for y'all's prayers. Also, uh, just as a reminder, uh, next Saturday uh, will be our trunk or treat. Uh, 4 p.m. will be set up time, and then we'll, uh, the event itself will be from 6 to 8. Uh, we will have not only uh, trunks and everything else set up back over here, but we'll also have a free hot dog supper in that. And again, um, even if you uh, may not plan to put a car together, we do invite everybody to do that. But even if you're not going to do that, we do invite you to come and to mingle with all the people who are here. Uh, just kind of introduce yourselves in the Bethany Church. Just make everybody feel welcome. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody there. And again, enjoying that time of outreach and fellowship uh, here at Bethany. And again, that'll be uh, next Saturday. Uh, set up at 4 and start at 6. Also, next Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday, I should say, we'll continue with Wednesday night youth group and uh, prayer meeting, which starts at 6.30. We invite everybody uh, for that. Also, uh, just take a look at the other announcements in your bulletin. And if you have any questions about them, just see the people listed there. And again, uh, also, as I saw in the bulletin this morning, I want to give thanks again for y'all's uh, love and support of me and Brandy and our kids. You know, I was looking at Facebook this morning. I usually don't like to check Facebook on Sunday morning because it gets me riled up. But uh, they uh, I was checked this morning, and uh, Facebook memories reminded me that on October 24th, uh, 2017, was the day uh, that we moved uh, to Bethany. And we give thanks again for all y'all's love over the past four years and uh, Look forward to the number uh, on there uh, reaching up to some of the uh, higher end ones up there. It's a, a goal to reach, I guess. But uh, again, thank you again uh, for y'all. But as we begin this morning, uh, let us go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Amen. As we come before the Lord God today, we do so uh, by hearing from his holy word. As he calls us to worship from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. As we hear these words today, we are reminded again of the blessings that we have, not only in Christ, uh, but in the promises that he's given to us. So we begin today at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I declare to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. And then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. Amen. As we hear these words and are reminded of the gospel that has been preached to us and of the truth that we have received from the Holy Scriptures, we hear again this testimony that we believe in a word that is not only true, but a word that is transformative 
and changes us. So let us respond unto this word, this assurance that we have by singing together a Bible song number nine. Let us stand as we sing from our green Bible song books, Morning Prayer, Psalm 5. Let us stand and sing together. especially because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who has given unto us his grace and his mercy and has strengthened us in every way that we might rejoice together. So let us come now before our God in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are the awesome God. You are majestic and grand and there is nothing that can compare to your power and your goodness and your love. You, dear God, have looked upon us, and you have called us unto yourself. You have given unto us that name which is above every name, and you have given unto every soul comfort and peace, because our strength is not found in ourselves, but in Christ. For he is the one who is able to heal us. He is the one who is able to lift us up, to see the heavens. Dear God, we pray this morning as we worship you, as we again meditate and consider your ways, that we would put aside the trials and tribulations of this life, that for but for a moment this morning, we will look and see the joy that we have in Jesus. For he is our king, he is our redeemer, and he is the one who lifts us up each and every morning. We pray these things using the words your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord, we turn now again uh, to a holy scripture. We continue to read through the Gospel of Luke. We see the ways in which the Lord is continuing to teach his disciples. And today we come to the parable of the Midas. As we hear from the Lord Jesus. Again, Luke 19, beginning there at verse 11.
You can hear the word of the Lord. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minus, and said to them, do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man, to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you are faithful and very little, you have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you, because you are an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit, and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minus. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minus. For I say to you that to everyone who has will, who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Please be seated. I invite the children to come down for the lesson today. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. good deal. Well, we just read a parable. Now, does anybody have any idea what a parable is? A story. That's right. It's a story. Now, what kind of story do you think a parable is? Anybody have any idea? Uh, God. All right. It's a story God tells. What else? That's right. Story from the Bible. Well, it's a story that Jesus is using to help us understand something that's more complicated. Now, when we hear about a minus, does anybody know what a minus is? A minus is like when you subtract. That's right. A minus is when you subtract. That's right. Well, in the Bible, a minus is like a dollar. Okay? It's a, it's a unit of, 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 of money. Okay, so these guys were given minuses, right? Spelled M-I-N-A-X. And they were supposed to do something with them, right? They'd been given to it, and one guy got, got some minus, and he turned them into how many? Ten, right? And another guy had five, and then one guy hid it and didn't want to share it with anybody. He didn't want, want to use it at all. Now, sometimes we hear this story, it can sound kind of strange, because... This guy you know, thought he was doing the right thing, right? He received this gift and he just held it to himself. Well, this parable is really about what we heard when we started worship today, when we heard about Paul talking about the gospel, right? The minus that we have received is the knowledge of Jesus Christ, 
And what are we supposed to do with the knowledge that we have of Jesus Christ? Are we supposed to keep it for ourselves? No. No. What are we supposed to do with it? Give it to the world. That's right. Give it to the world, right? Share it with everyone. And so when we think about this gospel that we've been given, we believe, right, that we sin, right, that we do bad stuff and that we uh, need to be forgiven for doing bad stuff. Now, who alone is able to forgive us? Uh, God, Jesus. That's right. God and Jesus, right? God the Father sent Jesus the Son to die for our sins on the cross. And we've received that great gift from him. And that gift is not just for us, but it's for the whole world, right? And who are we supposed to, uh, who is the whole world? Uh, God. God. Well, not God. Yeah. Who, who lives in the world? Us. People, right? Now, are we just supposed to share it with people at Bethany? No. No. We share it with everyone in the whole wide world. That's right. China, Australia, Japan. That's Asia. right. All the countries of the world, right? And we do that through you know, supporting missionaries, but we also do it by just sharing that news with people we know, right? With friends, with family, and, and telling them about Jesus. And so that's what that parable of the minus, which seems so weird to us, right? Because uh, when, when you went to Walmart last time, did you try to pay with a minus? No. Now, what would happen if you went to Walmart and tried to pay with a minus? Wouldn't coin it. That's, that's right, because they don't accept minuses at Walmart, right? They accept dollars. Well, you have something that you can share and that will be accepted, right? You have the gospel. And don't be afraid to share that with people, okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the good news that we've received, that we have been given this great gift. Let us not keep it for ourselves, but let us share it with others. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, one of the things we do when we share the gospel is we sing of the good things that God has done for us. And others here are singing. And we again come together to sing uh, Bible song number 188, Under His Wings. So let us sing together the deliverance that we received in Christ. And let us stand and sing with joy and thanksgiving.
we sing these wonderful words which remind us not only of the peace, but of the safety and of the comfort that we have because we live under the wings of the Almighty. Amen and amen. Let us be seated as we come before the Lord our God in prayer. Well, as we prepare to come before the Lord, uh, let us uh, ready ourselves for prayer. Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who has guided us through all of danger and all of trial and all the tribulations that we have faced in this life, the God who even when it seemed as if he was absent was ever present with us, the God who has loved us from the very day of our conception and the God who will bring us safely unto the land of promise. God, again, who has seen us in our trouble, has seen us in our darkness, has seen us in our own sin, and has washed us in the blood of His Son, who has given unto us refuge in His own arms. We think of the promise that we read in John chapter 10, that we are in the arms of Christ and Christ is held in the arms of the Father, and that there is no power, no power made by man that can ever take us away from him. Dear God, as we think upon that blessed truth this morning, let us draw strength from its reality. Let us shout down uh, those voices which tell us that we are not good enough to be in Christ. That we have done too many bad things to be saved. But to God, we know that our sinfulness is greater than even we can imagine. But we also know that your grace is more than sufficient for us. Your grace is the answer for all of our transgressions. That no matter how many times Satan uh, uh, looks at us and calls us out for our past sins, we can call back unto the evil one and say, yes, but Christ is greater. Christ has paid the penalty for that sin. Christ has taken that sin and thrown it as far as the east is from the west. And no longer is even he in the eyes of God. Dear God, as we do think about the magnificence of salvation and the redemption that we have in Christ, dear God, may we draw this morning your peace of the, in that truth. May we, dear God, see ourselves as Christ sees us, as members of his covenant family as those who have been adopted into that household, who are receiving the very inheritance promised unto Abraham, that we are the very people of God. And that while, again, we may be going through difficulties in the flesh, while we may be facing many, many difficulties, we know, dear God, that they are temporary that they are not forever, that you, dear God, will relieve us of them. Dear God, as we do consider those truths today, dear God, may we see more clearly your promise. Dear God, as we pray these things this morning and as we think upon again uh, just so many things that are on our minds, 
Dear God, may we lay them all at your feet. May we know that you are able to answer our prayers. That what is impossible with man is possible with God. May we take time during the week to lift up our needs unto you. May we remember that you have given unto us such a glorious opportunity that wherever we are, whatever it is that we are doing, that you are present and that you are ready to hear the prayers of your people because we are united to Christ by faith. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at the world around us and as we see the evil and as we see evil done to other people and we see the, the struggles of this world, we confess that it is easy for us to lose heart, uh, to be uh, hopeless in the midst of it. Dear God, we know that you are the sovereign God and that your hand is truly over all things. And that you, dear God, are working all things out to your glory in your time. And so we pray this morning, dear God, for patience. We pray for perseverance. We pray, dear God, that we would see with your eyes and not with the eyes of the flesh. And that we would remember that uh, many times in the scriptures, uh, your people waited 40 years, 40 days, 70 years for your promise to come to pass, but each and every time you were faithful. Dear God, may we rest in that faithfulness this morning. May we trust in your word and in your assurances, for your ways are greater than our ways, and your wisdom is greater than our own. And dear God, as we uh, lift up again the needs of this congregation this morning, as we pray uh, for those who continue to deal with physical ailments, dear God, we pray that you would bring healing unto their body. We pray, dear God, that you would bring answers as to how best to treat. And dear God, we do pray for their doctors and their nurses and the administrators at the hospitals and facilities. Dear God, we pray for them, especially today. We know that they have uh, quite a bit on their plate quite a bit of pressures coming from all sorts of directions. And dear God, we do pray uh, that you will give them again your peace as they go about their labors, but especially, dear God, as they uh, do what they do with those who are dear unto us. And dear God, we pray this morning, uh, not only for those who are struggling in these ways, but those who are wandering in uh, spiritual ways. We pray, dear God, that they uh, would be comforted, even if they refuse to be comforted. But dear God, you would forever pursue them and bring them back into the fold. We pray, dear God, that you would soften their hearts, soften their minds to receive your word. For we know, dear God, that your word is powerful enough to break even the hardest of hearts. And dear God, we do pray as you give us opportunity to witness to those who need to hear your word. We pray, dear God, that you would give us the right words to use and that, dear God, whatever words that come out of our mouths, dear God, we know that you will use them for your purpose. And dear God, we give thanks again that it is by your power that men come to salvation. For if it was up to us, dear God, we know that our abilities would, would, would not bring a soul into the kingdom. Dear God, again, we trust in your power and in your purpose. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, dear God, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, wherever they might be today, whether they might be in a pew here in York County or in a faraway place. We know that we are one faith and one baptism, that we're united together as one body in our Savior. God, we pray for them as we pray for ourselves that all of us would rest and trust and have our peace in Christ, who is our Savior, our Redeemer, and our King, both this day and forevermore, and in whose name we pray. Amen.
I invite you to stand this morning as we come to our sermon text today, which comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. Again, as we come to the reading of God's Word, again, let us stand. Genesis 3, beginning there at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig, fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you by your providence have given unto us these words of Scripture today, we pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The real question that is before us in this portion of of God's word is, has God really said? And really, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves every day. Has what God said in his word true? And not only that, but can we trust what God has said in his word? Because there's certain things we believe about the Bible. First of all, we don't believe that it was coddled together by a bunch of Jewish priests trying to give the people coming out of the land of Babylon something to hold on to. We also don't believe that the New Testament was written by a particular school of people who were trying to make sense of this Jesus fellow. And in fact, Paul actually hid parts of God's word because he didn't like them. Now, those things might sound ridiculous, and they are, but there are a lot of people who teach that kind of thing today. That the word of God is a creation of man. And that what we have in the Bible is really just the experience of the Jews and the apostles as to what they understand about God. And so part of the work of religion is to find the common thread that runs through the Bible and the Quran and the holy books of the Hindus and Buddha and just find that common thread and there you'll find the true God. Now, is that what we believe? Hopefully, everybody here is shaking their head. No, because we don't believe that. We believe that the Bible is the very word of the living and the true God. We believe that the Holy Spirit, through the work of Moses and the prophets and of the apostles, wrote down everything that the Lord God would have us to know about himself and about his people. And most especially, what we are to believe about how the world works and how we are to live and especially of the consequences of disobeying what the Lord has said. 
It's one of the reasons why we have to not just take seriously what we read in the Bible, but we have to be careful not to change what God has said in the Scriptures. Because that's what Eve does here. And that's where the problem begins. You notice that when the serpent says to her, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice what she says in response. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the uh, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, has God said anywhere in the previous portion that they are to not touch it? He hasn't. What are they not supposed to do? Eat it. So what has Eve already done? She's already introduced something that God has not said. It's similar to the way that the Pharisees loved to add to the law of God. And what happens when we add to the word? It causes confusion. Because you're not sure what it is you're supposed to believe. The Pharisees, they were holy people. Right? They were very religious, very outwardly religious. In fact, Jesus says their righteousness was above everyone else. But what else did Jesus call them? Blind leaders of the blind. He called them hypocrites. He called them uh, devils. And why did he call the Pharisees devils? Because they were deceivers. And that's again what Satan is doing in this passage. He's already deceived Eve before he's even come and talked to her. Because she's added to what God has said. Now why would Eve do that? Why would she add to the word of God? It's not because she's ignorant. It's because she actually thinks she's doing God a favor. You see, if God's told me not to eat it, well, I bet not touch it either. Now is that true? Maybe. But that's not what God has said. <coughs> and so when we hear this passage in Genesis chapter 3, again, we need to think about what the applications are for our own lives. But do we believe that what God has said in the scriptures is sufficient for our life? Or do we need to add to it? And if God has told us that we are not to do something, you know, are we to say, well, I just need to build a fence another 20 feet out from there so I don't even get near what I'm not supposed to do? Well, what does the Apostle Paul call it? He calls it legalism. And he calls it legalism because what it causes you to do is look at the law and see it as a taskmaster. See it as one that is putting more weight on you than you can bear. That's exactly what happened to the Jews. They looked at all these laws that the Pharisees had made up and they did not want to hear what God actually says in his word. And part of that is because the Pharisees had built themselves up this huge kind of secondary book of laws to the point that they never actually preached the Bible as it was written. They preached the commandments of men. Jesus, when he confronts them about this in Matthew 15, notes their hypocrisy by saying, you know, you're getting all mad and up in arms about the fact that my disciples aren't washing their hands before they eat, but you have given your parents over to the state to take care of. You have violated the weightier matters of the law, trying to keep yourself clean from minor things. Because what should the Pharisees have been doing? They should have been taking care of their parents. That's not the job of the state. That's the job of the family, to watch over the, the, the ones who are older. And why is that? Because we have the fifth commandment. One of the ways that you honor your father and your mother is by ministering to them when they are unable to care for themselves. And one of the reasons why you do that is because who took care of you when you were unable to take care of yourself? Your mom and dad, right? They watched over you, they fed you, they cleaned you, they raised you up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, right? They loved you. So you return that blessing unto them. 
Now, the Pharisees hadn't been doing that because, again, they were more worried about these outward things that they created in their own head. And another thing that the Pharisees had done in adding to the Word of God is that they caused the people of God to hate the Word of God because they confused what God had actually said with what the Pharisees had said. And again, that's what the devil does, does he not? And he confuses us. He causes there to be not just confusion, but the devil causes us to hate the Lord God. Causes us to hate his word. Causes us to despise what God has done. And again, we see that in the way that Eve responds to what uh, the devil says in this passage. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, again, in a sense, the devil's not wrong. Because what are they going to learn about when they eat the forbidden fruit? They're going to learn about evil. Right? They're going to learn about wickedness. They're going to learn about sin. They're going to learn about all of the wicked things that are possible. And how do we know that this is the case? Because as soon as, the, as, soon as Adam eats of the fruit, and we'll get into that in a second, but as soon as Adam eats of the fruit, what do they notice about themselves? That they're naked. Now, why would they notice that? Because remember, at the end of chapter 2, the passage that we read last week, they were naked and not ashamed. That their nakedness was not a problem because it was not shameful. But now it is. And why has it become shameful? Because of the introduction of sin. Because what does Adam's mind do now when he sees his wife? What does Adam's mind do now when he sees the nakedness? What, what, is, what happens? Again, it ruins this relationship. Because now they're ashamed of their name. Right? Adam sees imperfections that he didn't notice before. Right? Adam is drawn to lust in ways that he wasn't before. Right? Destruction and deviancy that come with sin is one of the greatest troubles which comes with sin. Right, the way that it affects the way we see what used to be good, we now see it in wicked and evil ways. And one of the you know, catechism questions that we went through a couple weeks ago it, it, you know, is what is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. And what we see happening here is that first half, that want of conformity. Now, the language there at first can be a little confusing, but once we think about what want means, well, when your child comes to you and says, I want something, what, what do we understand about that? Well, they don't have it at the present, and they want it right there. They don't have it in their possession. And so what does it mean that we're want of conformity unto the Lord? Well, we don't have conformity unto the Lord. We are in our very nature, without the Lord. And so that's another thing that we see here about the shame that comes from sin. Right? We should desire to be in the presence of the Lord, but what do we know that Adam and Eve will soon do? They will hide from the Lord. Right? They will be afraid of the Lord in ways that they had not been before. Right? There's good fear and bad fear. Right? The good fear of the Lord is that you recognize who God is and you respect, the, respect God, you serve Him, and you desire Him. Right? The bad fear of the Lord is that you are afraid of Him and you don't want to be near Him. In fact, you order your entire life so that you don't even have to be confronted by the Lord. 
And that's what they do. And notice something else about their hiding. How, how do they cover themselves? We're told there in verse 7 that they made fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, is that sufficient to cover their nakedness? No, it's not. Right? It, it's, it's not even close to being sufficient to cover their nakedness. But you know, there's a bigger point going on here, isn't there? It's not just about the fact that they can see their naked bodies, but they can see the shame. And they're seeking to cover themselves because they know they need to be covered. One of the lessons that God is going to do at the end of chapter 3 uh, that, that we'll talk about in more detail later is you notice that when they are being confronted by the Lord and after they've received the curse in verse 21, we're told that the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So God has taken the attempt that they had of covering themselves and he has now given them a proper cover. Covered them with skin because one of the things that happens when sin enters the world is now it gets cold and it gets hot. We don't usually think of sin in that way, but you know, sin brought weather into the world. Right? Sin made it hot. Sin made it cold. Sin made it so that you had to wear different clothing at different times of the year. Well, if you're living in a cold climate, is fig leaves going to be sufficient? No. What do you need? Right? You need the hide of an animal to warm yourself. Now, is God really just making them a hide of an animal so that they'll be warm in the winter? That's not really what God is doing, is it? Right? In that picture, we see the only answer for the shame that we feel in sin. It is death which is necessary. Because that wasn't present before Adam ate of the fruit. Right? Death is an interloper. It is an unnatural thing. It's one of the things we believe, again, about creation, that not only did lions eat vegetables, but we believe that there was no death of any kind before Adam ate of the fruit. And we believe that again because it's not just a bad thing for humans to die, but it's a bad thing for all animals to die. It should not be like this. Right? It should be the case that everything lives in felicity. Everything lives in peace. Everything lives in comfort with one another. The lamb should not be afraid of the lion. And then we should not be afraid of our brother. But sin has brought that into the world. And God says that the only solution for it is death. The only thing that can kill death is death. Now whose death is necessary for death to be taken care of? Well, we have the New Testament. We know that that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that only the Lord our God in sending his son could redeem, bring back that peace that existed in the garden. And that's what's pictured there in the death of the animal. To show them again what Adam's sin has caused in the world. And he covers them and he gives this. But back here at the beginning, as they are being introduced to evil, being introduced to wickedness, again, it all begins here with this questioning of the authority of God and of the word that he's given to his people. Not only do we see Eve add to the word of God, not only do we see her testify that she doesn't believe what God has said is enough for her, but we also see her believe the serpent when he says, you will not surely die. For God knows in the day of you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, her understanding of God is not enough in her eyes, right? She wants to know more about the world. Now, if God wanted her to know that, what would he have done? He'd have told her. One of the things about being a human being, one of the things about being a creature, is that we have to understand that we are not meant to know everything. We're not meant to have the kind of knowledge that God has. 
Because what is God? He's God. And what are we? We're human beings. And so part of being a human being is being uh, you of the understanding, of the mindset that we are to be thankful and see again the word that we've been given, Genesis 1 to, to Revelation 22, as being enough for what we need from day to day. We need to see the sufficiency of the word and we need to rest in it. We need again to understand that the secret things belong to the Lord and the things that we are to know we have been given. And in saying that, we need to be comforted in that truth. Because if we knew what God knew, could we handle it? Could, could, could our finite human brains handle the immensity of the eternal mind of the Lord? Well, I'm sure some people think they could, but we can't because of who we are. And that's one of the hardest things is to be humble in the face of the knowledge of God. To recognize again that we're not God and that if God has told us not to eat of the tree of the garden, what are we supposed to do? Not eat of it. And what happens a lot of times when your kids start asking you 9,000 questions about something? What, what eventually do you end up saying? Because I said so. Now, sometimes you say that because you're just tired of hearing that question for the 9,000th time. But also, it's because sometimes there are things that children cannot understand about how the world works, right? mature things that they're not ready to receive. And the same is true of the Christian life, of the believer. Right? There are things that we are just not meant to understand. But what are we meant to understand? Again, that the word that we have received is enough for us. And we're to be satisfied in that. Because what happens every time someone in the Bible tries to kind of get above their raising, as it were? When tries to do more than they've been told to do? Trouble always comes. Later on here in the book of Genesis, what will happen when they try to build a tower up to heaven to get a one-on-one -on -one with the Lord? the Lord will judge them harshly for that to the point that they then can't understand each other. And there's something about that judgment that's important for us to see. The Lord has taken those who were unwilling to listen, to heed to what has been revealed, and he caused confusion to come down upon them so that they could not understand each other anymore. And that's something, again, that we see in the midst of this garden picture with the serpent and the evil one who's come in. Because how did Satan come to be to begin with? We're told in the scriptures that what did Satan want? Satan wanted to be equal with the Lord. In fact, he wanted to overthrow the Lord. He was not satisfied with being an angel. And he wasn't just any angel, remember. Satan was the most fairest of the angels. You know, sometimes we have pictures of Satan and he has you know, horns and he's dressed in some weird red cape outfit and he has this um, you know, thingamajigger, I don't remember what it's called, the staff thing with the points on it. Uh, he has that thing, right? But that's not how Satan is presented to us in the scriptures. <clears throat> and how does Satan often appear to us? As an angel of light, as the fairest of all things. And why is it that is it important for us to remember that Satan is not something that we would want to run from, but something that we would run to? Because Satan understands how our minds work. Right? If he showed up as that guy with horns on his head, what would we do? Would we listen to him? Not likely, right? We would run from him. We would be afraid of him. But if he comes to us with sweet words, he comes to us with temptation. He comes to us, you know, with that sweet, cunning voice. What are we more likely to do? We're likely to listen to him, right? And isn't that how sin often presents itself to us? Right? Sin comes to us and says, you know what? If you do this, you'll be happy. Right? If, you, if you go and engage in this, you'll be better off than how you are right now. 
I, the, the grass is always greener on the other side in the words of Satan. And that's exactly what he's doing here with Eve, isn't he? He's saying, hey, you're not going to die. The reality is, is you're going to become just like God. You're going to know good and evil. And you're going to be just as powerful as him. And the reason why he's keeping this from you is because he doesn't want you to be like him. Like he's just being a big meanie pants. And he, he, he won't let you do these things. But again, what is the Lord saying? The Lord's saying that, look, you can eat of every tree in the garden. You can have peace. You can have comfort. You can have no shame whatsoever. And you can live in this garden until it is time for you to move on. But is that enough for Adam? Evidently not, is it? Because the first time Satan comes, they heed his call. And it all comes again from the lack of humility, the lack of seeing the, the, the glory of God, the sufficiency of God, the blessing of God, and wanting something that is not theirs to have. It's one of the things we're meant to learn from this passage, especially as we think of our own walk in Christ, is that question. Are we satisfied in the Lord? Are we satisfied with the salvation that we have received in Jesus Christ? Or do we want something more than that? Remember, what was it that made Judas so angry about Jesus Christ? That made him angry enough to turn Jesus into the authorities for 30 pieces of silver? And yes, 30 pieces of silver is like giving somebody 20 bucks. It's not exactly a grand reward. Why was he willing to do that? Because Jesus was not who he thought Jesus should be. He wanted Jesus to be that second David that came with a sword and rid the land of the Roman Empire. Now, think for a moment why that would have been a good thing. It's never fun to live under the subjection of a foreign power. It's 